One, the lawn in front of the terrace at Hunstanton Manor. Sir John, Lady Caroline Pontefract, and Miss Worsley are on chairs under a large yew tree. I believe this is the first English country house that you have stayed at, Miss Worsley. Oh, yes, Lady Caroline. You have no country houses, I am told, in America? We have not many. Have you any country? Uh, what we would call country? We have the largest country in the world, Lady Caroline. They used to tell us at school that some of our states are as big as France and England put together. Huh. You must find it very drafty, I should fancy. John, you should have your muffler. What is the use of my always crocheting mufflers for you if you won't wear them? I am quite warm, Caroline, I assure you. I think not, John. Well, you couldn't have come to a more charming place than this, Miss Worsley, though the house is excessively damp, quite unpardonably damp, and dear Lady Hunstetten is sometimes a little lax about the people she asks down here. Jane mixes too much. Lord Illingworth, of course, is a man of high distinction. It is a privilege to meet him. And that member of parliament, Mr. Kettle? Kelville, my love. Kelville. He must be very respectable. One has never heard his name before in the whole course of one's life, which speaks volumes for the man nowadays. But that Mrs. Allenby is hardly a very suitable person. I just like Mrs. Allenby. I dislike her more than I can say. I am not sure, Miss Worsley, that foreigners like yourself should cultivate likes or dislikes about the people they are invited to meet. Mrs. Allenby is very well born. She's the niece of Lord Brancaster. It is said, of course, that she ran away twice before she was married. But you know how unfair people often are. I myself don't believe she ran away more than once. Mr. Arbuthnot is very charming. Ah, yes. The young man who has a post at the bank. Lady Hunstetten is most kind in asking him here, and Lord Illingworth seems to have taken quite a fancy to him. I am not sure, however, that Jane is right in taking him out of his position. In my young days, Miss Worsley, one never met anyone in society who worked for a living. It was not considered the thing. In America, those are the people we respect most. Hmm, I have no doubt about it. Mr. Arbuthnot has a beautiful nature. He is so simple, so sincere. He has one of the most beautiful natures I have ever come across. It is a pleasure to meet him. It is not customary in England, Miss Worsley, for a young woman to speak with such enthusiasm of any person of the opposite sex. English women conceal their feelings until after they are <laughs> married. They show them then. Do you, in England, allow no friendship to exist between a young man and a young girl? We think it very inadvisable. Enter Lady Hunstanton. Jane, I was just saying what a pleasant party you have asked us to meet. You have a wonderful power of selection. It is quite a gift. Dear Caroline, how kind of you. I think we all do fit in very nicely together. And I hope our charming American visitor will carry back Pleasant recollections of our English country life. Uh, the cushion there, Francis, and my shawl, 
the Shetland. Get the Shetland. Enter Gerald Arbuthnot. Lady Hunstanton, I have such good news to tell you. Lord Illingworth has just offered to make me his secretary. His secretary? Oh, that is good news indeed, Gerald. It means a very brilliant future in store for you. Your dear mother will be delighted. I really must induce her to come up here tonight. Do you think she would, Gerald? I know how difficult it is to get her to go anywhere. Oh, I'm sure she would, Lady, Hun Lady Hunstanton, if she knew Lord Illingworth had made me such an offer. Oh, I will write and tell her about it and ask her to come up and meet him. This is a very wonderful opportunity for so young a man as you are, Mr. Arbuthnot. It is indeed, Lady Caroline. I trust I shall be able to show myself worthy of it. I trust so. You have not congratulated me yet, Miss Worsley. Are you very pleased about it? Well, of course I am. It means everything to me. The things that were out of reach of hope may be within reach of hope free now. Nothing should be out of reach of hope. Life is a hope. I fancy, Caroline, that diplomacy is what Lord Illingworth is aiming at. I heard he was offered Vienna, but that may not be true. I don't think that England should be represented abroad by an unmarried man. Jane, it might lead to complications. You are too nervous. Caroline, believe me, you are too nervous. Besides, Lord Illingworth may marry any day. I was in hopes he would have married Lady Kelso, but I believe he said her family was too large. Or was it her feet? I, I forget which. <laughs> <laughs> I have written a letter to your dear mother, Gerald, to tell her your good news and to say she really must come to dinner. That is awfully kind of you, Lady Hunstanton. Will you come for a stroll, Miss Worsley? With pleasure. They exit to the gardens. I am very much gratified at Gerald Arbuthnot's good fortune. He is quite a protege of mine. And I am particularly pleased that Lord Illingworth should have made the offer of his own accord without, without my suggesting anything. Nobody likes to be asked favours. John, the grass is too damp for you. You had better go and put your overshoes on at once. I am quite comfortable, Caroline, I assure you. You must allow me to be the best judge of that, John. Pray, do as I tell you. John reluctantly gets up and leaves. You spoil him, Caroline, you do indeed. Enter Mrs. Allenby and Lady Stutfield. Well, dear. I hope you like the park. It is said to be well timbered. The trees are wonderful, Lady Hunstanton. Uh, quite, quite wonderful. But somehow I feel sure if I lived in the country for six months, I should become so unsophisticated that no one would take the slightest notice of me. I assure you, dear, that the country has not that effect at all. Why, it was from Melthorpe, which is only two miles from here, that Lady Belton eloped with Lord Feathersdale. I remember the occurrence perfectly. Poor Lord Belton died three days afterwards of, of joy or gout. Now, I forget which. We had a large party here at the time, so we were all very much interested in the whole affair. I think to elope is cowardly. It's running away from danger, and danger has become so rare in modern life. As far as I can make out, the young women of the present day seem to make it the sole object of their lives to always be playing with fire. The one advantage of playing with fire, Lady Caroline, is that one never gets even singed. It is the people who don't know how to play with it who get burned up. Uh, yes, I see that. It is very, very helpful. I don't know how the world would get on with such a theory as that, dear Mrs. Allenby. Ah, uh, the world was made for men and not for women. 
Oh, don't say that, Lady Stutfield. We have a much better time than they have. There are far more things forbidden to us than are forbidden to them. Yes, uh, that is quite, quite true. I had not thought of that. Sir John re-enters with Mr. Kelville. Well, Mr. Kelville, have you got through your work? I've finished my writing for the day, Lady Hun Stanton. It has been an arduous task. The demands on the time of a public man are very heavy nowadays, very heavy indeed. And I don't think that they meet with adequate recognition. John, have you got your overshoes on? Yes, my love. I think you had better come sit over here, John. It is more sheltered. I am quite comfortable, Caroline. I think not, John. You had better sit beside me. And what have you been writing about this morning, Mr. Kelville? On the usual subject, Lady Stutfield, on purity. That must be such a very, very interesting thing to write about. It is the one subject of really national importance nowadays, Lady Stutfield. I purpose addressing my constituents on the question before Parliament meets. I find that the poorer classes of this country display a marked desire for a higher ethical standard. Oh, how quite, quite nice of them. Are you in favor of women taking part in politics, Mr. Kettle? Oh, Kelville, my love. Kelville. The growing influence of women is the one reassuring thing in our political life, Lady Caroline. Mm -hmm. Women are always on the side of morality, public and private. It's so very, very gratifying to hear you say that. Ah, yes. The moral qualities in women, that is the important thing. I am afraid, Caroline, that dear Lord Illingworth doesn't value the moral qualities in women as much as he should. The world says that Lord Illingworth is very, very wicked. Lord Illingworth enters. What world says that, Lady Stutfield? It must be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everyone I know says you are very, very wicked. <laughs> it is perfectly monstrous the way people go about nowadays, saying things against one's behind, one's back, that are absolutely and entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord Illingworth is quite hopeless, Lady Stutfield. I have given up trying to reform him. It would take a public company with a board of directors and a paid secretary to do that. <laughs> but you have the secretary already, Lord Illingworth, haven't you? Gerald Arbuthnot has told us of his good fortune. It is really most kind of you. Oh, don't say that, Lady Hunstanton. Kind is a dreadful word. I took a great fancy to you young Arbuthnot not the moment I met him, and he'll be of considerable use to me in something I am foolish enough to think of doing. He is an admirable young man, and his mother is one of my dearest friends. He has just gone for a walk with our pretty American. She is very pretty, is she not? Far too pretty. These American girls carry off all the good matches. Why can't they stay in their own country? They're always telling us it is the paradise of women. It is, Lady Caroline. That is why, like Eve, they are so extremely anxious to get out of it. Who are Miss Worsley's parents? American women are wonderfully clever in concealing their parents. Oh, my dear Lord Illingworth, what do you mean? Miss Worsley, Caroline, is an orphan. Her father was a very wealthy millionaire, or philanthropist, or, or both, I believe, who entertained my son quite hospitably when he was in Boston. I don't know how he made his money originally. I fancy an American dry goods. What are an American dry goods? Uh, American novels. <laughs> <laughs> how very singular. Well... From whatever source her large fortune came, I have a great esteem for Miss Worsley. 
she dresses exceedingly well. All Americans do dress well. They get their clothes in Paris. They say, Lady Hudstanton, that when good Americans die, they go to Paris. <laughs> Indeed. And when bad Americans die, where do they go? Oh, they go to America. Oh, I'm afraid you don't appreciate America, Lord Illingworth. It is a very remarkable country, especially considering its youth. The youth of America is their oldest tradition. It has been going on now for 300 years. To hear them talk, one would imagine they were in their first childhood. As far as civilization goes, they are in their second. There's undoubtedly a great deal of corruption in American politics. I, I suppose you allude to that. I wonder. Politics are in a sad way everywhere, I am told. They certainly are in England. Dear Dr. Cardew is ruining the country. I wonder Mrs. Cardew allows him. I am sure, Lord Illingworth, you don't think uneducated people should be allowed to have votes. I think that they are the only people who should. Do you take no sides, then, in modern politics, Lord Illingworth? One should never take sides in anything, Mr. Kelville. Taking sides is the beginning of sincerity, and earnestness follows shortly afterwards, and the human being becomes a bore. However, the House of Commons really does very little harm. You can't make people good by act of parliament. That is something. You cannot deny that the House of Commons has always shown great sympathy with the sufferings of the poor. Uh, dear Dr. Dobney, our rector here, provides, with the assistance of his curates, really admirable recreations for the poor during the winter. And much good may be done by means of a, of a magic lantern or a missionary or some popular amusement of that kind. I am not at all in favor of amusements for the poor, Jane. Blankets and coals are sufficient. There's too much love of pleasure amongst the upper classes as it is. Health is what we want in modern life. The tone is not healthy, not at all. May I ask, Lord Illingworth, if you regard the House of Lords as a better institution than the House of Commons? A much better institution, of course. We in the House of Lords are never in touch with the public opinion. That makes us a civilized body. Are you serious in putting forth such a view? Quite serious, Mr. Kelter. Mrs. Allenby, vulgar habit that it is people have nowadays of asking one after one has given them an idea whether one is serious or not. Nothing is serious except passion. The intellect is not a serious thing and never has been. It is an instrument on which one plays, that is all. The onlyest form of intellect I know is the British intellect. And on the British intellect, the illiterate plays the drum. Are you going, Mrs. Allenby? Oh, just as far as the conservatory. Lord Illingworth told me this morning there is an orchid there as beautiful as the seven deadly sins. Oh, oh my dear, I hope there is nothing of the kind. I shall certainly speak to the gardener. Mrs. Allenby exits with Lord Illingworth. Remarkable type, that Mrs. Allenby. She lets her clever tongue run away with her sometimes. Is that the only thing Jane, Mrs. Allenby, allows to run away with her? I hope so, Caroline, I am sure. Enter Lord Alfred from the house. Dear Lord Alfred, do join us. You believe good of everyone, Jane. It is a great fault. Do you really, really think, Lady Caroline, that one should believe evil of everyone? I think it is much safer to do so, Lady Stutfield. Unless, of course, people are found out to be good. But that requires a great deal of investigation nowadays. But there is so much unkind scandal in modern life. 
Lord Illingworth remarked to me last night at dinner that the basis of every scandal is an absolute immoral certainty. Lord Illingworth is, of course, a very brilliant man, but he seems to me to be lacking in that fine faith in the nobility and purity of life, which is so important in this century. Yes, quite, quite important, isn't it? He gives me the impression of a man who does not appreciate the beauty of our English home life. I would say that he was tainted with foreign ideas on the subject. There is nothing, nothing like the beauty of home life, is there? It is the mainstay of our moral system in England, Lady Stutfield. Without it, we would become like our neighbours. That would be so, so sad, would it not? I'm afraid, too, that Lord Illingworth regards women simply as a toy. Now, I have never regarded woman as a toy. Woman is the intellectual helpmeet of a man in public as in private life. Without her, we should forget the true ideals. I'm so very, very glad to hear you say that. Are you a married man, Mr. Kettle? Hillville, my love. Calville. I am married, Lady Caroline. Family? Yes. How many? Eight. Mrs. Kettle and the children are, I suppose, at the seaside. Yeah, my wife is at the seaside with the children, Lady Caroline. You will join them later on, no doubt. If my public engagements permit me. Your public life must be a great source of gratification to Mrs. Kettle. Kelville, my love, Kelville! <clears throat> oh, very, very charming. Those gold-tipped cigarettes of yours are, Lord Alfred. They are awfully expensive. I can only afford them when I'm in debt. It must be terribly, terribly distressing to be in debt. One must have some occupation nowadays. If I hadn't my debts, I shouldn't have anything to think about. All the chaps I know are in debt. <laughs> but don't the people to whom you owe the money give you a great, great deal of annoyance? Oh, no. They write. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> How very, very strange. Ah, here is a letter, Caroline, from dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, she won't dine. I am so sorry. But... She will come in the evening. Oh, I'm so very pleased indeed. She is one of the sweetest of women and writes a beautiful hand too. So large, so firm. Hmm. A little lacking in femininity, Jane. Femininity is a quality I admire most in women. Oh, she is very feminine, Caroline, and so good too. You should hear what the Archdeacon says of her. He regards her as his right hand in the parish. Shall we all go in? Uh, sh Lady Stutfield, shall we all go in to tea? With pleasure, Lady Hunstanton. John, if you would allow your nephew to look after Lady Stutfield's cloak, you might help me with my work basket? Certainly, my love. They all exit to the tea room. Enter Lord Illingworth and Mrs. Allenby. Curious thing. Plain women are always jealous of their husbands. Beautiful women never are. Beautiful women never have time. They are always so occupied in being jealous of other people's husbands. I should have thought Lady Caroline would have grown tired of conjugal anxiety by this time. Sir John is her fourth. <laughs> so much marriage is certainly not becoming. Twenty years of romance makes a look, woman look like a ruin. But twenty years of marriage make her look something like a, a public building. Twenty years of marriage? Is there such a thing? Not in our day. Women have become too brilliant. Nothing spoils a romance so much as a sense of humor in the woman. Or oh, the want of it in a man? Oh, you're quite right. In a temple, everyone should be serious except the thing that is worshipped. And that should be man? 
women kneel so gracefully. Don't, men don't. You are thinking of Lady Stutfield. I assure you I was not thinking of Lady Stutfield for at least the last half, quarter hour. Is she such a mystery? She is more than a mystery. She is a mood. Moods don't last. It is their chief charm. Hester and Gerald enter from the garden. Lord Illingworth, everyone has been congratulating me. Lady Hunstanton and Lady Caroline and, and, well, everyone. Oh, I hope I shall make a good secretary. You will be a pattern secretary, Gerald. You enjoy country life, Miss Worsley? Very much indeed. Don't you find yourself longing for a London dinner party? I dislike London dinner parties. I adore them. The clever people never listen, and the stupid people never talk. I think the stupid people talk a great deal. Uh, uh, I never listen. My dear boy, if I didn't like you, I wouldn't have made you the offer. It is because I love you so much that I want you with me. Hester and Gerald exit together. Charming fellow, Gerald Arbuthnot. He is very nice, very nice indeed. But I can't stand the American young lady. Why? She told me yesterday, in a quite a loud voice too, that she was only 18. It was most annoying. One should never trust a woman who tells one her real age. A woman who would tell one that would tell one anything. She is a Puritan besides. Ah, uh, that is inexcusable. I don't mind plain women being Puritan. It is the only excuse they have for being plain, but she is decidedly pretty. I admire her immensely. What a thoroughly bad man you must be. What do you call a bad man? The sort of man who admires innocence. And what do you call a bad woman? Oh, the sort of woman a man never gets tired of. You are severe on yourself. Define us as a sex. Uh, sphinxes without secrets. Does that include the Puritan women? Do you know, I don't believe in the existence of Puritan women. I don't think there is a woman in the world who would not like to be a little flattered if one made love to her. It is that which makes women so irresistibly adorable. You think there is no woman in the world who would object to being kissed? Very few. Miss Worsley would not let you kiss her. Are you sure? Quite. What do you think she would do if I kissed her? Either marry you or strike you across the face with her glove. What would you do if she struck you across the face with her glove? Fall in love with her, probably. <laughs> then it is lucky you are not going to kiss her. Is that a challenge? It is an arrow shot into the air. Don't you know that I always succeed in whatever I try? I am sorry to hear it. We women adore failures. Lord Illingworth, there is one thing I shall always like you for. Only one thing, and I have so many bad qualities. Ah, don't be too conceited about them. You may lose them as you grow old. I never intend to grow old. The soul is born old but grows young. That is the comedy of life. And the body is born young and grows old. That is life's tragedy. It's comedy also sometimes. But what is the mysterious reason why you will always like me? It is that you have never made love to me. I have never done anything else. Really? I 
haven't noticed it. How fortunate. It might have been a tragedy for both of us. We should each have survived. One can survive everything nowadays except death <laughs> and live down anything except a good reputation. Have you tried a good reputation? It is one of the many annoyances to which I have never been subjected. It may come. Why do you threaten me? I will tell you when you have kissed the Puritan. Shall we go to tea? Do you like such simple pleasures? I adore simple pleasures. They are the last refuge of the complex. But if you wish, uh, let us stay here. Yes, let us stay here. The book of life begins with a man and a woman in a garden. And ends with revelations. What a curious handwriting. It reminds me of the handwriting of a woman I used to know years ago. Who? Oh, no one. No one in particular. A woman of no importance. He drops the letter and exits up the terrace with Mrs. Allenby. Two, the drawing room at Hunt Stanton Manor. After dinner, the ladies are seated on sofas, drinking coffee. Oh, what a comfort it is to have got rid of the men for a little. Yes, the men persecute us dreadfully, don't they? Persecute us? I wish they did. <laughs> My dear. The annoying thing is that the wretches can be perfectly happy without us. That is why it is every woman's duty never to leave them alone for a single moment, except during this short breathing space after dinner, without which I believe we poor women would be absolutely worn to shadows. <laughs> Worn to shadows, dear. Oh, yes, Lady Hunstanton. It is such a strain keeping men up to the mark. They are always trying to escape from us. It seems to me that it is we who are always trying to escape from them. Men are so very, very heartless. They oh, know their power and use it. What stuff and nonsense all this about men is. The thing to do is to keep men in their place. What is their proper place, Lady Caroline? Looking after their wives, Mrs. Allenby. Really? And if they're not married? If they are not married, they should be looking for a wife. It is perfectly scandalous the amount of bachelors who are going about society. There should be a law passed to compel them to marry within a year. But if they are in love with someone who perhaps is tied to another? In that case, Lady Stutfield, they should be married off in a week to some plain, respectable girl in order to teach them not to meddle with other people's property. I don't think we should ever be spoken of as other people's property. All men are married women's property. That is the only true definition of what married women's property really is. But we don't belong to anyone. Oh, I'm so very, very glad to hear you say so. Well, I, I suppose the type of husband has completely changed since my young days. But I'm bound to state that poor dear Hun Stanton was the most delightful of creatures, and as good as gold. <sighs> My husband is a sort of promissory note. I'm tired of meeting him. But you renew him from time to time, don't you? Oh no, Lady Caroline. I have only had one husband as yet. I suppose you look upon me as quite an amateur. With your views on life, I wonder that you're married at all. No, do I. 
my dear child, I believe you are really very happy in your married life, but that you like to hide your happiness from others. I assure you, I was horribly deceived in earnest. Oh, I hope not, dear. I knew his mother quite well. She was a Stratton, Caroline, one of Lord Crowland's daughters. <gasps> Victoria Stratton. Mm. I remember her perfectly. A silly fair-haired woman with no chin. Ah, Ernest has a chin. He has a very strong chin, a square chin. Ernest chin is far too square. Do you really, really think a man's chin can be too square? I think a man should look very, very strong and that his chin should be quite, quite square. Then you should certainly know Ernest, Lady Sturtfield. It is only fair to tell you beforehand he's got no conversation at all. I adore silent men. Oh, Ernest isn't silent. He talks the whole time, but he has got no conversation. When he talks about its things, I, I don't know what he's talking about. I haven't listened to him for years. Have you never forgiven him then? How sad that seems. Uh, but all oh, life is very, very sad, is it not? Life, Lady Studfield, is simply a mauvais quart d'oeuvre, made up of exquisite moments. Oh, yes, there are moments, certainly. But was it something very wrong that Mr. Allenby did? Did he become angry with you and say anything that was unkind or true? Oh dear, no. Ernest is invariably calm. That is one of the reasons he always gets on my nerves. Men's good temper shows they are not so sensitive as we are, not so finely too strong. It makes a great barrier often between husband and wife, does it not? But I would so much like to know what was the wrong thing Mr. Allenby did. Well, I'll tell you if you solemnly promise to tell everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I will make a point of repeating it. When Ernest and I were engaged, he swore to me positively on his knees that he had never loved anyone before in the whole course of his life. I was very young at the time, so I didn't believe him, I needn't tell you. Unfortunately, however, I made no inquiries of any kind till after I had been married four or five months. I found out then what he had told me was perfectly true. That sort of thing makes a man so absolutely uninteresting. Oh, my dear. <laughs> Men always want to be a woman's first love. That is their clumsy vanity. Women have a more subtle instinct about things. What we like is to be a man's last romance. I see what you mean. It is very, very beautiful. Oh, my dear child, you don't mean to tell me that you won't forgive your husband because he never loved anyone else? Did you ever hear such a thing, Caroline? I am quite surprised. Oh, women have become so highly educated, Jane, that nothing should surprise us nowadays except a happy marriage. They apparently are getting remarkably rare. Oh, they're quite out of date. Except for amongst the middle classes, I, I have been told. How like the middle classes? Yes, is it not very, very like them? If what you tell us about the middle classes is true, Lady Stutfield, it redounds greatly to their credit. It is much to be regretted that in our rank of life, the wife should be so persistently frivolous under the impression, apparently, that it is the proper thing to be. It is to that I attribute the unhappiness of so many marriages we all know of in society. Do you know, Lady Caroline, I don't think the frivolity of the wife has ever anything to do with it. More marriages are ruined nowadays by the common sense of the husband than by anything else. 
how can a woman be expected to be happy with a man who insists on treating her as a perfectly rational being? Oh, my dear. <laughs> man, poor, awkward, reliable, necessary man belongs to a sex that has been rational for millions and millions of years. He can't help himself. It is in his race. The history of woman is very different. We have always been picturesque protests against the mere existence of common sense. We saw its dangers from the first. Yes, the common sense of husbands is certainly most, most trying. Uh, do tell me your conception of the ideal husband. I think it would be so very, very helpful. The ideal husband? Oh, there couldn't be such a thing. The institution is wrong. Well, the ideal man, then, in his relations to us. He would probably be extremely realistic. The ideal man. Oh, the ideal man should talk to us as if we were goddesses and treat us as if we were children. He should always say much more than he means and always mean much more than he says. If we ask him a question about anything, he should give us an answer all about ourselves. He should invariably praise us for whatever qualities he knows we haven't got. And he should be pitiless, quite pitiless, in reproaching us for the virtues we have never dreamed of possessing. He should never believe that we know the use of useful things. That would be unforgivable but he should shower on us everything we don't want. As far as I can see, he is to do nothing but pay bills and compliments. He should persistently compromise us in public and treat us with absolute respect when we are alone. And yet, he should always be ready to have a perfectly terrible scene whenever we want one and to become miserable, absolutely miserable at a moment's notice, and to overwhelm us for with just reproaches in less than 20 minutes, and to be positively violent at the end of half an hour, and to leave us forever at a quarter to eight when we have to go and dress for dinner. And when, after that, one has seen him for really the last time, and he has refused to take back the little things he has given one, and promised never to communicate with one again, or to write one any foolish letters, he should be perfectly heartbroken, and telegraph to one all day long, and send one little notes every half hour by a private handsome, and dine quite alone at the club, so that everyone should know how unhappy he was. And after a whole dreadful week, during which one has gone everywhere with one's husband, just to show how absolutely lonely one was. He may be given a, a third last parting in the evening, and then, if his conduct has been quite irreproachable, and one has behaved really badly to him, he should be allowed to admit that he has been entirely in the wrong. And when he has admitted that it becomes a woman's duty to forgive, and one can do it all over again from the beginning with variations. <laughs> How clever you are, my dear. You never mean a single word you say. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It has been quite entrancing. I must try and remember it all. There are such a number of details that are so very, very important. But you have not told us yet what the reward of the ideal man is to be. His reward? Oh, infinite expectation. <laughs> that is quite enough for him. <laughs> uh, do you think, Mrs. Allenby, I shall ever meet their ideal man? Or are there more than one? 
There are just four in London, Lady Stutfield. Oh, my dear. What had happened? Do oh. tell me. I had completely forgotten that the American young lady has been in the room all the time. I am afraid that some of this clever talk may have shocked her a little. Ah, that will do her so much good. Oh, let us hope she didn't understand too much. I think I had better go over and talk to her. Well, dear Miss Worsley, how quiet you have been in your nice little corner all this time. I suppose you have been reading a book. There are so many books here in the library. No, oh, I have been listening to the conversation. Oh, you mustn't believe everything that was said, you know, dear. I didn't believe any of it. Oh, that is quite right, my dear. I couldn't believe that any woman could really hold such views of life as I have heard from some of your guests this evening. <clears throat> I hear you have such pleasant society in America, quite like our own in places, my son wrote to me. There are cliques in America as elsewhere, Lady Hunstanton, but true American society consists simply of all the good women and good men we have in our country. What a sensible system, and I dare say quite pleasant too. I am afraid in England we have too many artificial social barriers. We don't see as much as we should of the middle and lower classes. In America, we have no lower classes. Really? What a strange arrangement. What is that dreadful girl talking about? She is painfully natural, is she not? There are a great many things you haven't got in America, I am told, Miss Worsley. They say you have no ruins, no curiosities. What nonsense! They have their mothers and their manners. The English aristocracy supply us with our curiosities, Lady Caroline. They are sent over to us every summer regularly in the steamers and propose to us the day after they land. As for ruins, we are trying to build up something that will last longer than brick or stone. Uh, what is that, dear? Ah, yes, an iron exhibition, is it not? At that place with the curious name? We are trying to build up life, Lady Hunstanton, on a truer, better, purer basis than life rests on here. You rich people in England, you don't know how you're living. How could you know? You shut out from society the gentle and the good. You laugh at the simple and the pure, living as you do on others and by them. You sneer at self-sacrifice, and if you throw bread to the poor, it is merely to keep them quiet for a season. With all your pomp and wealth and art, you don't know how to live. You don't even know that. You love the beauty that you can see and touch and handle and destroy and do destroy, but of the unseen beauty of life, of the unseen beauty of a higher life, you know nothing. You've lost life's secret. Your English society seems to me shallow, selfish, foolish, it is all wrong. All wrong. I, I don't think one should know of these things. It is very, not very, very nice, is it? Uh, my dear Miss Worsley, I thought you liked English society so much. You were such a success in it. And you were so much admired by all the best people. I quite forget what Lord Henry Weston mm -hmm. said of you, but it was most complimentary, and you know what an authority he is on beauty. Lord Henry Weston? I remember him, Lady Hunstanton, a man with a hideous smile and a hideous past. He is asked everywhere. No dinner party is complete without him. 
one of those whose ruin is due to him, they are outcasts. They are nameless. If you met them in the street, you would turn your head away. I don't complain of their punishment. Let all women who have sinned be punished. Oh, my dear young lady. It is right that they should be punished, but don't let them be the only ones to suffer. If a man and woman have sinned, let them both go forth into the desert to love or loathe each other there. Don't punish one and let the other go free. You are unjust to women in England. Mrs. Arbuthnot enters from the terrace. Oh, my dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, I am so pleased you have come up, but I didn't hear you announce. Oh, no, I came straight in from the terrace, Lady oh. Hunstanton, just as I was. You didn't tell me you had a party. Not a party. Only a few guests who are staying in the house and whom you must know. Allow me. <coughs> Caroline, this is Mrs. Arbuthnot, one of my sweetest friends. Lady Caroline Pontefract, Lady Stuck. Field, Mrs. Allenby, and my young American friend, Miss Worsley, who has just been telling us all how wicked we are. <laughs> I'm afraid you think I spoke too strongly, Lady Hunstanton, but there are some things in England... Oh, my dear young lady, I dare say there was truth, a great deal of truth, in what you said. And you looked very pretty while you said it, which is much more important, as Lord Illingworth worth would tell us. <laughs> <sighs> but now, dear, do come and make friends with Mrs. Arbuthnot. She is one of the sweet, good, simple people you told us we never admitted into society. I'm sorry to say, Mrs. Arbuthnot comes very rarely to me, but that is not my fault. Oh, what a bore it is, the men staying so long after dinner. I expect they are saying the most dreadful things about us. Do you really think so? I was sure of it. How very, very horrid of them. Shall we go on to the terrace? Oh, anything to get away from the dowagers and the dowdies. Oh, we are only going to look at the stars, Lady Hunstanton. You will find a great many, dear, a very great many, but don't catch cold. <clears throat> we shall all miss Gerald so much, Mrs. Arbuthnot. But has Lord Illingworth really offered to make Gerald his secretary? Oh, yes, oh, yes. He has been most charming about it. He has the highest possible opinion of your boy. Oh. Uh, you don't know Lord Illingworth, I believe, dear. I have never met him. You know him by name, no doubt. I'm afraid I don't. I live so much out of the world and see so few people. I remember hearing years ago of an old Lord Illingworth who lived in Yorkshire, I think. Ah, yes. That would be the last Earl but one. He was a very curious man. He wanted to marry beneath him, or, or wouldn't, I believe. There was some scandal about it. The present Lord Illingworth is quite different. He is very distinguished. He does, well, <laughs> he does nothing, which I am afraid our pretty American visitor here thinks very wrong of anybody. Mm. And I don't know that he cares very much for the subjects in which you are so interested, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Uh, do you think, Caroline, that Lord Illingworth is interested in the housing of the poor? I should fancy not at all, Jane. Well, we all have our different tastes, have we not? <laughs> but Lord Illingworth has a very high position, and there is nothing he couldn't get if he chose to ask for it. Of course, he is comparatively a young man still, and he has only come to his title within, oh, how long exactly is it, Caroline, since Lord Illingworth succeeded? Hmm. I think about four years, Jane. I know it was the same year in which my brother had his last exposure in the evening newspapers. Ah, I remember. That would be about four years ago. 
Of course, there were a great many people between the present Lord Illingworth and the title Mrs. Arbuthnot. There was, who was there, Caroline? Oh, there was poor Margaret's baby. You remember how anxious she was to have a boy, and it was a boy, but then it died. And her husband died shortly thereafter, and she married almost immediately one of the sons of Lord Ascot, who, I am told, beats her. That is in the family, dear. That is in the family. And there was also, I remember, a clergyman who wanted to be a lunatic. Oh, a lunatic who wanted to be a clergyman, I forget which, but... I know the court of Chancery investigated the matter and decided that he was quite sane. And I, I saw him afterwards at poor Lord Plumstead with straws in his hair or something very odd about him. I can't recall what. I often regret, Lady Caroline, that dear Lady Cecilia never lived to see her son get the title. Lady Cecilia? Oh, Lord Illingworth's mother, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, was one of the Duchess of Jerningham's pretty daughters. And she married Sir Thomas Hartford, who wasn't considered a very good match for her at the time, though he was said to be the handsomest man in London. I knew them all quite intimately, and both the sons, Arthur and George. Oh, it was the eldest son who succeeded, of course, Lady Hunstanton. Oh, no, dear. He was killed in the hunting field. Or was it fishing, Caroline? I forget. Hmm. George came in for everything. I always tell him that no younger son has ever had such good luck as he has had. <laughs> oh, uh, but Lady Hunstanton, um, I want to speak to Gerald at once. Might I see him? Certainly, dear. I will send one of the servants into the dining room to fetch him. I don't know what keeps the gentleman so long. When I knew Lord Illingworth first as plain George Harford, he was simply a very brilliant young man about town, with not a penny of money to his name except what poor dear lady Cecilia gave him. She was quite devoted to him chiefly, I fancy, because he was on bad terms with his father. <laughs> oh, here is the dear Archdeacon. The Archdeacon, Lady Stutfield, Mrs. Allenby, and Lord Illingworth enter. Lord Illingworth have been most entertaining. I have never enjoyed myself more. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, you see, I... I have got Mrs. Arbuthnot to come to me at last. That is a great honor, Lady Hunstanton. Mrs. Daubeny will be quite jealous of you. Ah, uh, I am so sorry Mrs. Daubeny could not come with you tonight. Headache, as usual, I suppose. A perfect martyr. But she is happiest alone. She is happiest alone. Mrs. Arbuthnot watches Lord Illingworth as he crosses to Mrs. Allenby. How is the most charming woman in the world? We are quite well, thank you, Lord Illingworth. But what a short time you have been in the dining room. It seems as if we had only just left. I was bored to death. Never opened my lips the whole time. Absolutely longing to come in. Oh, you should have. That American girl has been giving us a lecture. Really? All Americans lecture, I believe. I suppose it is something in their climate. What does she lecture about? Oh, Puritanism, of course. I am going to convert her, am I not? How long do you give me? A week. A week is more than enough. Gerald enters. Dear mother. Gerald, I don't feel well at all. See me home, Gerald. I shouldn't have come. Oh, I'm so sorry, mother, certainly. Uh, but you must know Lord Illingworth first. Uh, not tonight, Gerald. Uh, Lord Illingworth, I want you so much to know my mother. With the greatest of pleasure. I'll be back in a moment. 
people's mothers always bore me to death. All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That is his. What a delightful mood you are in tonight. Mother, this is Lord Illingworth, who has offered to make me his private secretary. It is a wonderful opening for me, isn't it? Oh, I hope you won't be disappointed in me. That is all. You'll thank Lord Illingworth, Mother, won't you? Lord Illingworth is very good, I am sure, to interest himself in you for the moment. Oh, Jairus and I are great friends already, Mrs. Arbuthnot. There can be nothing in common between you and my son, Lord Illingworth. Dear mother, how can you say so? Of course, Lord Illingworth is awfully clever and that sort of thing. There's nothing Lord Illingworth does it now. Now, my dear boy. He knows more about life than anyone I've ever met. I feel an awful duffer when I am with you, Lord Illingworth. Of course, I've had so few advantages. I have not been to Eton or Oxford like other chaps, but Lord Illingworth doesn't seem to mind that. He has been awfully good to me, Mother. Lord Illingworth may change his mind. He may not really want you as a secretary. Mother! You, you must remember, as you said yourself, you have had so few advantages. Lord Illingworth, I want to speak to you for a moment. Do come over. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Arbuthnot? Don't let your charming mother make you any more difficulties, Gerald. The thing is quite settled, isn't it? I hope so. Caroline, shall we all make a move to the music room? Miss Worsley is going to play. You'll oh. come too, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, won't you? You don't oh. know what a treat is in store for you. I Oh, dear Dr. Dobney, I must really take Miss Worsley down some afternoon to the rectory. Mm. I should so much like dear Mrs. Dobney to hear her on the violin. Ah, I forgot. <laughs> dear Mrs. Dobney's hearing is a little defective, is it not? A deafness is a great probation to her. She can't even hear my sermons now. All she reads them at home. But she has many resources in herself, many resources. She reads a good deal, I suppose. Just the very largest print. The eyesight is rapidly going. But she's never morbid, never morbid. Do speak to my mother, Lord Yardingworth, before you go into the music room. She seems to think somehow you don't mean what you said to me. Coming. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, Lady Hanstant, and uh, if Mrs. Arbuthnot would allow me, I, I would like to say a few words to her, and we will join you later on. Of course. You will have a great deal to say to her, and she will have a great deal to thank you for. It is not every son who gets such an offer, Mrs. Arbuthnot, but I know you appreciate that, dear. Now, don't keep Mrs. Arbuth not too long, dear Lord Illingworth. We can't spare her. <laughs> she exits, following the other guests as Hester begins to play the violin. So, that is our son, Rachel. Well, I am very proud of him. He is a Harford, every inch of him. By the way, why Arbuth not, Rachel? One name is as good as another, when one has no right to any name. I suppose so. But why Gerald? After a man whose heart I broke. After my father. Well, Rachel, what is over is over. All I have got to say now is, is that I am very, very much pleased with our boy. The world will me know him merely as my private secretary. But to me, he, he will be something very near and very dear. It's a curious thing, Rachel. My life seemed to be quite complete. It was not so. It lacked something. It lacked a son. I have found my son now. I am glad to have found him. You have no right to claim him, or the smallest part of him. 
The boy is entirely mine and shall remain mine. My dear Rachel, you have had him to yourself for over 20 years. Why not let me have him for a little now? He is quite as much mine as yours. Are you talking of the child you abandoned? Of the child, as far as you are concerned, might have died of hunger and of want. You forget, Rachel. It was you who left me. It was not I who left you. I left you because you refused to give the child a name. Before my son was born, I implored you to marry me. I had no expectations then. And besides, Rachel, I wasn't much older than you were. I, I was only 22. I was 21, I believe, when the whole thing began in your father's garden. When a man is old enough to do wrong, he should be old enough to do right also. My dear Rachel, intellectual generalities are always interesting, but generalities and morals means absolutely nothing. As for saying I left our child to starve, that of course is untrue and silly. My mother offered you 600 a year. Why wouldn't you take anything? You simply disappeared and carried the child away with you. I wouldn't have accepted a penny from her. Your father was different. He told you in my presence when we were in Paris that it was your duty to marry me. Oh, duty is one what expects from others. It's not what one does oneself. Of course, I was influenced by my mother. Every man is when he is young. I'm glad to hear you say so. Gerald shall certainly not go away with you. What nonsense, Rachel. Do you think I would allow my son... Our son? My son to go away with the man who spoiled my youth, who ruined my life, who has tainted every moment of my days. You don't realize what my past has been in suffering and in shame. My dear Rachel, I must candidly say that I think Gerald's future considerably more important than your past. Gerald cannot separate his future from my past. That is exactly what he should do. That is exactly what you should help him do. Rachel, I want you to look at this matter from the common sense point of view, from the point of view of what is best for our son, leaving you and me out of the question. What is our son at present? An underpaid clerk in a small provincial bank in a third-rate English town. If you imagine he is quite happy in such a position, you are mistaken. He is thoroughly discontented. He was not discontented till he met you. You have made him so. Of course I made him so. Discontent is the first step in the progress of a man or a nation. But I do not leave him with a mere longing for things he cannot get. No, I made him a charming offer. He jumped at it. I need hardly say, any young man would. And now simply because it turns out that I am the boy's own father and he'd be my own son, you propose practically to ruin his career. That is to say, if I were a perfect stranger, you would allow Gerald to go away with me. But as he is my own flesh and blood, you won't. How utterly illogical you are. I will not allow him to go. How can you prevent it? What excuse can you give to him for making him decline such an offer as mine? I won't tell him what relations I stand to him. I need hardly say. But you daren't tell him. You know that. Look how you have brought him up. I have brought him up to be a good man. Right, so. And what is the result? You have educated him to be your judge if ever he finds you out, and a bitter, unjudged just he will be to you. 
don't be a deceived, Rachel. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. George, don't take my son away from me. I have had 20 years of sorrow, and I've had only one thing to love me. Only one thing to love. You have had a life of joy and pleasure and success. You've been quite happy, and you have never thought of us. There was no reason, according to your views of life, why should you have remembered us at all. Your meeting us was a mere accident, a horrible accident. Oh, forget it. Oh, don't come now and rob me of, of all I have in the world. You are so rich in other things. Oh, leave me, my little vineyard of my life. Leave me the walled in garden and the well of water, the ewe lamb God sent me, in pity or in wrath. Oh, leave me that. George, don't take Gerald from me. Rachel, at the present moment, you are not necessary to Gerald's career. I am. There is nothing more to be said on the subject. I will not let him go. Here is Gerald. He has a right to decide for himself. Well, dear mother, I hope you have settled it all with Lord Illingworth. I have not, Gerald. Your mother seems not to like your coming with me for some reason. Why, mother? I thought you were quite happy here with me, Gerald. I didn't know you were so anxious to leave me. Mother, how can you talk like that? Of course I have been quite happy with you. But a man can't always stay with his mother. No chap does. I want to make myself a position to do something. I thought you would have been proud to see me in Lord Illingworth's secretary. I do not think you would be suitable as a private secretary to Lord Illingworth. You have no qualifications. Uh, uh, I do not wish to seem to interfere for a moment, Mrs. Arbuthnot. But as far as your last objection is concerned, I surely am the best judge. And I can only tell you that your son has all the qualifications I had hoped for. He has more, in fact, than I had even thought of, far more. Have you any other reason, Mrs. Arbuthnot, why you don't wish your son to accept this post? Have you, mother? Do you answer. If you have, Mrs. Arbuthnot, pray, pray say it. We are quite by ourselves here. Whatever it is, I need not say or will not repeat it. Mother? If you would like to be alone with your son, I will leave you. You may have some other reason you don't wish me to hear. I have no other reason. Then, my dear boy, we may look on the thing as settled. Come. You and I will smoke a cigarette on the terrace together. And Mrs. Arbuthnot, pray let me tell you that I think you have acted very, very wisely. He exits with Gerald, leaving Mrs. Arbuthnot alone. Act Three. The parlour in Hunstanton Manor. Lord Illingworth and Gerald are lounging about on sofas. Thoroughly sensible woman, your mother, Gerald. I knew she would come round in the end. My mother is awfully conscientious, Lord Illingworth. And I know she doesn't think I am educated enough to be your secretary. She is perfectly right, too. I was fearfully idle when I was at school, and I couldn't pass an examination now to save my life. My dear Gerald, examinations are of no value whatsoever. If a man is a gentleman, he knows quite enough. And if he is not a gentleman, 
whatever he knows is bad for him. But I am so ignorant of the world, Lord Illingworth. Don't be afraid, Gerald. Remember that you've got on your side the most wonderful thing in the world, youth. There is nothing like youth. The middle-aged are mortgaged to life. The old are in life's lumber room. But youth is the lord of life. Youth has a kingdom waiting for it. Everyone is born a king and most people die in exile like most kings. To win back my youth, Gerald, there is nothing I wouldn't do except take exercise, get up early, or be a useful member of the community. But you don't call yourself old, Lord Illingworth. I am old enough to be your father, Gerald. I don't remember my father. He died years ago. So Lady Hunstanton told me. It is very curious. My mother never talks about my father. I sometimes think she must have married beneath her. There is nothing like youth. The middle-aged are mortgaged to life. The old are in life's lumber room. But youth is the lord of life. Youth has a kingdom waiting for it. Everyone is born a king and most people die in exile like most kings. To win back my youth, Gerald, there is nothing I wouldn't do except take exercise, get up early, or be a useful member of the community. But you don't call yourself old, Lord Illingworth. I am old enough to be your father, Gerald. I don't remember my father. He died years ago. So Lady Hunstanton told me. It is very curious. My mother never talks about my father. I sometimes think she must have married beneath her. Really? You have missed not having a father, I suppose, Gerald. Oh, no. My mother has been so good to me. No one ever had such a mother as I have have had. I am quite sure of that. Still, I should imagine that most mothers don't quite understand their sons. Don't realize, I mean, that a son has ambitions, a desire to see life, to make himself a name. After all, Gerald, you couldn't be expected to pass all your life in such a hole as Rockley, could you? Oh, no. It would be dreadful. A mother's love is very touching, of course, but it is often curiously selfish. I, I mean, there is a good deal of selfishness in it. I suppose there is. Your mother is a thoroughly good woman. But good women have such limited views of life. Their horizon is so small. Their interests are so petty, aren't they? And they are awfully interested, certainly, in things we don't care much about. I suppose your mother is very religious and, and that sort of thing. Oh, yes. She's always going to church. Ah, she is not modern. And to be modern is the only thing worth being nowadays. You want to be modern, don't you, Gerald? You want to know life as it really is, not to be put off with any old-fashioned theories about life. Well, what you have to do at present is simply fit yourself for best society. A man who could dominate a London dinner table can dominate the world. The future belongs to the dandy. It is the exquisites who are going to rule. I should like to wear nice things awfully, but I have always been told that a young man should not think too much about his clothes. But it is very difficult to get into society, isn't it? To get into the best society nowadays, one either has to feed people, amuse people, or shock people, that is all. I suppose society is wonderfully delightful. <sighs> to be in it is merely a bore, 
but to be out of it is simply a tragedy. Society is a necessary thing. No man has real success in the world unless he has got women to back him. And women rule society. If you have not got women on your side, you are quite over. You might just as well be a barrister or a stockbroker or journalist at once. It is very difficult to understand women, is it not? <laughs> you should never try to understand them. Women are pictures, men are problems. If you want to know what a woman really means, which by the way is always dangerous thing to do, look at her. Don't listen to her. But women are awfully clever, aren't they? One should always tell them so, but to the philosopher, <laughs> my dear Gerald, women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent triumph of mind over morals. How then can women have so much power as you say they have? The history of women is the history of the worst form of tyranny the world has ever known. The tyranny of the weak over the strong. It is the only tyranny that lasts. You have never been married, have you, Lord Illingworth? <sighs> Men marry because they are tired. Women, because they are curious. Both are disappointed. But don't you think one can be happy when one is married? Perfectly happy. But the happiness of a married man, my dear Gerald, depends on the people he has not married. But if one is in love? One should always be in love. That is the reason one should never marry. Love is very wonderful, isn't it? When one is in love, one begins by deceiving oneself and one ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance, but a really grand passion is comparatively rare nowadays. It is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. That is the one use of the idle classes in our country. And, and the only possible explanation for us Harfords. Harfords, Lord Illingworth. That is my family name. You should study the peerage, Gerald. It is the one book a young man about town should know thoroughly. And it is the best fiction in English that has ever been written. And now, Gerald, you are going into a perfectly new life with me. And I want you to know how to live. For the world has been made by fools that wise men should live in it. Enter Lady Hun Stanton and Archdeacon Dobbany from the next room. Ah, there you are, dear Lord Illingworth. Well, I suppose you have been telling young Gerald what his new duties are to be. Oh, I am so sorry. I was not here to listen to you, but I suppose I am too old now to learn. Oh, except from you, dear Archdeacon, when you are in your nice pulpit. <laughs> but then I always know what you're going to say, so I don't feel alarmed. Mrs. Arbuthnot enters from the terrace. Ah, oh, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, come dear, come join us. Gerald has been having a much needed long talk with Lord Illingworth. I am sure you must feel very much flattered at the pleasant way in which everything has turned out for him. Let us sit down. And, and how is your beautiful embroidery going on? I am always at work, Lady Hunstanton. Mrs. Daubeny embroiders a little, doesn't she? She was very deft with her needle once, quite a darkest. But the gout has crippled her fingers a great deal. She has not touched the tambour frame for nine or ten years. But she has many other amusements. She is very much interested in her own health. 
Ah, oh, that is always a nice distraction, is it not? Now, what are you talking about, Lord Illingworth? Do tell us. I was on the point of explaining to Gerald that the world has always laughed at its own tragedies, that being the only way in which it has been able to bear them, and that consequently whatever the world has treated seriously belongs to the comedy side of things. Oh, now I am quite out of my depth. I usually am when Lord Illingworth says anything. And the humane society is most careless. They never rescue me. I am left to sink. <laughs> I have a dim idea, dear Lord Illingworth, that you are always on the side of the sinners. And I know I always try to be on the side of the saints, but that is as far as I get. And after all, it may be merely the fancy of a drowning person. The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Oh, that quite does for me. I am, haven't a word to say. You and I, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, are behind the age. We can't follow Lord Illingworth. Too much care was taken with our education, I am afraid. To have been well brought up in is, is a great drawback nowadays. It shuts one out from so much. I should be sorry to follow Lord Illingworth in any of his opinions. You are quite right, dear. Enter Lady Caroline, agitated. Uh, Jane, uh, have you seen John anywhere? Oh, you needn't be anxious about him, dear. He is with Lady Stutfield. I saw them some time ago in the yellow drawing room. They seem quite happy together. You're not going, Caroline. Pray sit down. I think I had better look after John. It doesn't pay. It doesn't do to pay men so much attention. And Caroline really has nothing to be anxious about. Lady Studfield is very sympathetic. She is just as sympathetic about one thing as she is about another, a beautiful nature. Enter Sir John together with Mrs. Allenby. Here is Sir John and with Mrs. Allenby too. I suppose it was Mrs. Allenby I saw him with, uh, Sir John. Caroline has been looking everywhere for you. We have been waiting for We have waiting been waiting for, for you in the music room, dear Lady Hunstanton. Ah, the music room, of course. I thought it was the yellow drawing room. My memory is getting so defective. Uh, the Archdeacon, Mrs. Dobney has a wonderful memory, has she not? She used to be quite remarkable for her memory. But since her last attack, she chiefly remembers the events of her early childhood. But she finds great pleasure in such retrospections. Great pleasure. Enter Lady Stutfield and Mr. Kelville. Ah, dear Lady Stutfield, and what has Mr. Kelville been talking to you about? About bimetallism, as well as I remember. By metalism, is that quite a nice subject? <laughs> I know people discuss everything very freely nowadays. <laughs> what did Sir John talk to you about, dear Mrs. Allenby? About Patagonia. Oh, uh, really? Uh, what a remote topic, but very improving, I have no doubt. He has been most interesting on the subject of Patagonia. Savages seem to have quite the same views as cultured people on almost all subjects. They're excessively advanced. What do they do? Apparently, everything. Well, it is very gratifying, dear Archdeacon, is it not? To find that human nature is permanently one. <laughs> On the whole, the world is the same world, is it not? I have been discovering all kinds of beautiful qualities in my own nature. Ah, don't become quite perfect all at once. Do it gradually. 
<laughs> I don't intend to grow perfect at all. At least I hope I shan't. It would be most inconvenient. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our gigantic intellects. It is premature to ask us to forgive analysis. We forgive adoration. That is quite as much as should be expected from us. Ah, we women should forgive everything. Shouldn't we, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot? I am sure you agree with me on that. I do not, Lady Hunstanton. I think there are many things women should never forgive. What sort of things? The ruin of another woman's life. She distances herself from the group. Ah, those things are very sad, no doubt. But I believe there are admirable homes where people of that kind are looked after and reformed. And I think on the whole, the secret of life is, is to take things very, very easily. The secret of life is to never have an emotion that is unbecoming. The secret of life is to appreciate the pleasure of being terribly, terribly deceived. The secret of life is to resist temptation, Lady Stutfield. There is no secret of life. Life's aim, if it has one, is simply to be always looking for temptations. There are not nearly enough. I sometimes pass a whole day without coming across a single one. It is quite dreadful. It makes one so nervous about the future. I don't know how it is, dear Lord Illingworth, but everything you have said today seems to me excessively immoral. It has been most interesting listening to you. Ah, there is my carriage. Oh, my dear Archdeacon, it is only half past ten. I am afraid I must go with Lady Hanstanton. Tuesday is always one of Mrs. Darby's bad nights. Well, I won't keep you from her. I have told Farquhar to put a brace of partridges into the carriage. Mrs. Daubney may fancy them. It is very kind of you, but Mrs. Darby never touches salads now. Lives entirely on jellies. But she is wonderfully cheerful. She is wonderfully cheerful. She has nothing to complain of. He exits with Lady Hunstanton. There is a beautiful moon tonight. Let us go look at it. To look at anything that is inconstant is charming nowadays. You have your looking glass. It is unkind. It merely shows me my wrinkles. Mine is better behaved. It never tells me the truth. And it is in love with you. Lord Hildingworth, may I come too? Do, my dear boy. Gerald. What, mother? It is getting late. Let us go home. My dear mother, do let us wait a little longer. Lord Illingworth is so delightful. And by the way, Mother, I have a great surprise for you. We are starting for India at the end of the month. Let us go home. If you really want to, of course, but I must bid goodbye to Lord Illingworth first. I'll be back in five minutes. He leaves to join the group. Let him leave me if he chooses, but not with him. Not with him. I couldn't bear it. Enter Hester Worsley. What a lovely night it is, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Is it? Mrs. Arbuthnot, I wish that you would let us be friends. You are so different from the other women here. When you came into the drawing room this evening, somehow you brought with you a sense of what is good and pure in life. I had been foolish. There are things that are right to say, but... That may be said at the wrong time and to the wrong people. I heard what you said. I agree with it, Miss Worsley. I didn't know that you had heard it, 
but I knew you would agree with me. A woman who has sinned should be punished, shouldn't she? Yes. She shouldn't be allowed to come into society of good men and women. She should not. And the man should be punished in the same way. In the same way. And the children, if there are children, in the same way also. Yes. It is right that the sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is a just law. It is God's law. It is one of God's terrible laws. You are distressed about your son leaving, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, yes. Do you like him going away with Lord Illingworth? Of course, there is position and money, but position and money are not everything, are they? Well, they are nothing. They bring misery. Then why do you let your son go with him? He wishes it himself. But if you asked him, he would stay, wouldn't he? Oh, he has his heart set on going. He couldn't refuse you anything. He loves you too much. Ask him to stay. Let me send him in to you. He is on the terrace at the moment with Lord Illingworth. I heard them laughing as I passed through the music room. Don't trouble, Miss Worsley. I can wait. It is of no consequence. No, I'll tell him that you want him. Do... Do ask him to stay. She exits to the terrace. Oh, he won't come. I know he won't come. Enter Lady Caroline with Gerald. Uh, uh, Mr. Arbuthnot, may I ask you, is Sir John anywhere on the terrace? No, Lady Caroline, he is not on the terrace. Oh, this is very curious. It is time for him to retire. Dear mother, I'm afraid I've kept you waiting. I forgot all about it. I am so happy tonight, mother. I have never been so happy. At the prospect of going away. Don't put it like that, mother. Of course I am sorry to leave you. Why, you are the best mother in the whole world. But after all, as Lord Illingworth says, it is impossible to live in a place such as Rockley. You don't mind it. But I'm ambitious. I want something more than that. I want to have a career. I want to do something that will make you proud of me. And Lord Illingworth is going to help me. He is going to do everything for me. Oh, Gerald, don't go away with Lord Illingworth. I, I, I implore you not to. Gerald, I, I beg you. Mother, how changeable you are. You don't seem to know your own mind for a single moment. An hour and a half ago in the drawing room, you agreed to the whole thing. Now you turn round and make objections and try to force me to give up my one chance in life. Yes, my one chance. You don't suppose men like Lord Illingworth are to be found every day, do you, Mother? It's very strange that when I've had such a wonderful piece of good luck, the one person that put difficulties in my way should be my own mother. Besides, you know, Mother, I love Hester Westing. Who could help loving her? I love her more than I've ever told you, far more. And if I had a position, if I had prospects, well, I could, well, I, I could fear ask you. you need have no hopes of Miss Worsley. I know her views on life. She has told them to me. Then I have my ambition left at any rate. That is something I am glad I have that. You've always tried to crush my ambitions, mother, haven't you? You've told me that the world is a wicked place, that sex is not worth having, that society is shallow and all that sort of thing. Well, I don't believe it, Mother. I think the world must be delightful. I think society must be exquisite. I think success is a thing worth having. You are wrong in all that you have told me, Mother. Quite wrong. Lord Illingworth is a successful man. He is a fashionable man. He is a man who lives in the world and for it. Well, I would give anything to be just like Lord Illingworth. 
I would sooner see you dead. Mother, what is your objection to Lord Illingworth? Tell me, tell me right out. What is it? What is it? He is a bad man. In what way bad? I don't understand what you mean. I will tell you. I suppose you think him bad because he doesn't believe the same things as you do. Well, men are different from women, mother. It is natural they should have different views. It is not what Lord Illingworth believes or what he does not believe that makes him bad. It is what he is. Mother, is it something you know of him? Something you actually know? It is something I know. Something you are quite sure of. Quite sure of. And how long have you known it? For 20 years. Now, is it fair to go back 20 years in any man's career? And what have you or I to do with Lord Illingworth's early life? What business is it of ours? What this man has been. He is now and will be always. Mother, tell me what Lord Illingworth did. If he did anything shameful, I will not go away with him. Surely you know me well enough for that. Oh, Gerald. Come near to me, quite close to me, as you used to do when you were a little boy, when you were mother's own boy. Gerald, there was a girl once. She was very young. She was little over 18 at the time. George Harford, that, that was Lord Illingworth's name then. George Harford met her. She knew nothing about life. He knew everything. He made this girl love him. He made her love him so much that she left her father's house with him one morning. She loved him so much. And he had promised to marry her. He had solemnly promised to marry her and, and she had believed him. She was very young and, and ignorant of what life really is. But he put the marriage off from week to week and month to month. She trusted in him all the while. She loved him. Before her child was born, for she had a child, she implored him for the child's sake to marry her, that the child might have a name, that her sin might not be wished on the child, might not be visited. The child was innocent. He refused. After the child had been born, she left him, taking the child away. And her life was ruined. And her soul was ruined. And all that was sweet and good and pure in her ruined also. She suffered terribly. Oh, she suffers now. She will always suffer. That is why I call Lord Illingworth a bad man. That is why I don't want my boy to be with him. My dear mother, it all sounds very tragic, of course. But I dare say the girl was just as much to blame as Lord Illingworth was. After all, would a really nice girl, a girl with any nice feelings at all, go away from a home with a man to whom she was not married? And live with him as his wife? No nice girl would. Uh, Gerald, I withdraw all my objections. You are at liberty to go with Lord Illingworth when and where you choose. Dear mother, I knew you wouldn't stand in my way. You are quite the best woman God ever made. And as for Lord Illingworth, I don't believe he's capable of anything infamous or base. I can't believe it of him, I can't. We hear a voice from the terrace. Let me go! Let me go! Oh, save me! Save me from him! From whom? He has insulted me! Horribly insulted me! Save me! Who? Who is dead? Lord Illingworth runs in from the terrace. Lord Illingworth. You have insulted the purest thing on God's earth, a thing as pure as my own mother. You have insulted the woman I love most in the world with my own mother. 
as there is a God in heaven, I will kill you. No! No! Don't hold me back, Mother! Don't hold me, I'll kill him! Gerald! Let me go, I say! Oh, stop, Gerald, stop! He is your own father! Mrs. Arbuthnot sinks to the ground in shame. After a moment, Gerald crosses to her, puts an arm around her, helps her up, and together they leave the room. Act 4. The drawing room at Mrs. Arbuthnot's. Gerald is writing in a table as Alice, the maid, enters. Lady Hunstanton and Mrs. Allenby. Good morning, Gerald. Good morning, Lady Hunstanton. Good morning, Mrs. Allenby. We came to inquire for your dear mother, Gerald. I hope she's better. Uh, my mother has not come down yet, Lady Hunstanton. Ah. Uh, I am afraid the heat was too much for her last night. I think there must have been thunder in the air. Or perhaps it was, perhaps it was the music. Music makes one feel so romantic. At least it always gets on one's nerves. It's the same thing nowadays. I'm so glad I don't know what you mean, dear. I am afraid you mean something wrong. Ah. I see you are examining Mrs. Arbuthnot's pretty room. Isn't it nice and old-fashioned? It looks quite the happy English home. That's just the word, dear. That just describes it. One feels your mother good influence in everything she has about her, Gerald. Lord Illingworth says that all influence is bad, but that a good influence is the worst in the world. When Lord Illingworth knows Mrs. Arbuthnot better, he will change his mind. I must certainly bring him here. I should like to see Lord Illingworth in a happy English home. You do him a great deal of good, dear. Most women in London nowadays seem to furnish their, their rooms with nothing but orchids, Forerunners and French novels. But here we have the room of a sweet saint. Fresh natural flowers, books that don't shock one, and pictures that one can look at without blushing. I like blushing. Well, there is a good deal to be said for blushing if one can do it at the proper moment. Poor dear Hun Stanton used to tell me that I didn't blush nearly often enough. But then he was so very particular. He wouldn't let me know any of his men friends except those who were over 70. <laughs> by the by, Gerald, I hope your dear mother will come and see me more often now. You and Lord Illingworth start almost immediately, don't you? I have given up my intention of being Lord Illingworth's secretary. Uh, surely not, Gerald. It would be most unwise of you. What reason can you have? I don't think I should be suitable for the post. I wish Lord Illingworth would ask me to be his secretary, but he says I'm not serious enough. Oh, my dear Mrs. Allenby, how can you say that? But really, Gerald, what do you mean by not being suitable? Lord Illingworth's views of life and mine are too different. But my dear Gerald, at your age you shouldn't have any views of life. They are quite out of place. You must be guided by others in this matter. Lord Illingworth has made you the most flattering offer, and travelling with him you would see the world, as much of it at least as one should look at, under the best auspices possible and stay with all the right people which is so important at this solemn moment in your career. I don't want to see the world. I've seen enough of it. I hope you don't think you've exhausted life Mr Arbuthnot. When a man says that one knows that life has exhausted him. I don't wish to leave my mother. Now, Gerald, that is pure laziness on your part. Not leave your mother. If I were your mother, I would insist on your going. 
Mrs. Arbuthnot's compliments, my lady, but she has a bad headache and cannot see anyone this morning. Oh, a bad headache. I, I am so sorry. Perhaps you will bring her up to Hunt Stanton this afternoon if she's better, Gerald? I am afraid not this afternoon, Lady Hunt Stanton. Well, tomorrow then. Ah, if you had a father, Gerald, he wouldn't let you waste your life here. He would send you off with Lord Illingworth at once. But mothers are so weak. They give up to their sons in everything. <laughs> we are all heart, all heart. Ah, come dear Mrs. Allenby, I must call at the rectory and inquire for Mrs. Daubney, who I am afraid is far from well. It is wonderful how the Archdeacon bears up, quite wonderful. He is the most sympathetic of husbands, quite a model. <laughs> Goodbye, dear Gerald, and give my fondest love to your mother. Goodbye, Mr. Arbuthnot. Goodbye. Lady Hunstanton and Mrs. Allenby exit. Gerald sits down at his desk and reads over his letter. What name can I sign? I who have no right to any name. Mother, I have just written to him. Oh, to whom? To my father. I have written to tell him to come here at four o'clock this afternoon. Oh, he shall not come here. He shall not cross the threshold of my house. He must come. Uh, Gerald, if you are going away with Lord Aylingworth, go at once. Go before it kills me. But don't ask me to meet him. Mother, you don't understand. Nothing in the world will induce me to go away with Lord Illingworth or to leave you. Surely you know me well enough for that. Now, I have written to him to say What that can you have to say to him? Can't you guess, Mother, what I have written in this letter? No. Mother, surely you can. Think, think what must be done now, at once, for the next few days. There is nothing to be done. I have written to Lord Illingworth to tell him that he must marry you. Marry me? Mother, I will force him to do it. The wrong that has been done to you must be repaired. Atonement must be made. Justice may be slow, Mother, but it comes in the end. In a few days, you shall be Lord Illingworth's lawful wife. But, Gerald... I will insist upon him doing it. I will make him do it, or he will not dare refuse. But, Gerald... It is I who refuse. I will not marry Lord Illingworth. Not marry him, mother. I will not marry him. But you don't understand. It is for your sake I am talking, not for mine. This marriage, this necessary marriage, this marriage which for obvious reasons must inevitably take place, will not help me, will not give me a name that will rightfully, surely be mine to bear. But surely it will be something for you, that you, my mother, should however late become the wife of the man who is my father. Will there not be something? I will not marry him. Mother, you must. I will not. You talk of atonement for, for a wrong done. What atonement can be made to me? There is no atonement possible. I am disgraced. He is not. That is all. It is the usual history of a man and a woman, as it usually happens, as it always happens. And the ending is the ordinary ending. The woman suffers, and the man goes free. I don't know if that is the ordinary ending, Mother. I hope it is not. But your life, at any rate, shall not end like that. The man shall make whatever reparation is possible. It is not enough. It does not wipe out the past. I know that. But at least it makes the future better. Better for you, Mother. I refuse to marry Lord Illingworth. If he came to you himself and asked you to be his wife, you would give him a different answer. Remember, he is my father. If he came himself, which he will not do, my answer would be the same. Remember, I am your mother. Mother, you make it terribly difficult by, for me by talking like that. I can't understand why you won't look at this matter from the right, from the only proper standpoint. 
It is not to take away the bit is it is to take away the bitterness out of your life, to take away the shadow that lies on your name, that this marriage must take place. There is no alternative. And after the marriage, you and I can go away together. But the marriage must take place first. It is a duty that you owe, not merely to yourself, but to all other women. Yes, to all other women in the world, lest he betray more. I owe nothing to other women. There is not one of them to help me. There is not one woman in the world to whom I could go for pity, if I would take it, or for sympathy, if I could win it. Women are hard on each other. That girl last night, good though she is, fled from the room as though I were a tainted thing. But she was right. I am a tainted thing. But my wrongs are my own. And I will bear them alone. Why well, must bear them alone? What have women who have not sinned to do with me? Or I with them? We do not understand each other. We see a figure moving behind on the terrace. I implore you to do what I ask you. What son has ever asked of his mother to make so hideous a sacrifice? None. What mother has ever refused to marry the father of her own child? None. Well, let me be the first then. I will not do it. Mother, you believe in religion and you brought me up to believe in it also. Well, surely your religion, the religion you taught me when I was a boy, mother, must tell you that I am right. You know it, you feel it. I do not know it, and I do not feel it, nor will I ever stand before God's altar and ask God's blessing on so hideous a mockery as a marriage between me and George Harford. I will not say the words the church bids us to say. I will not say them. I dare not. How can I swear to love the man I loathe? To honor him who wrought you dishonor, to obey him who in his mastery made me to sin. No, marriage is a sacrament for those who love each other. It is not for such as him, nor such as me. Gerald, to save you from the world's sneers and taunts, I have lied to the world. For 20 years, I have lied to the world. I could not tell the world the truth. Who can ever? But not for my sake will I lie to God and in God's presence. No, Gerald, no ceremony, church hallowed or state made, shall ever bind me to George Harford. It may be that I am too bound to him already, who robbing me. Yet, oh, left me richer, so that in the mire of my life I found the pearl of price. Or what I thought would be so. I don't understand you now. Men don't understand what mothers are. I am no different from other women, in, except in the wrong done me and the wrong I did. And my very heavy punishments and great disgrace. And yet, to bear you, I had to look on death. To nurture you, I had to wrestle with it. Death fought with me for you. All women have to fight with death to keep their children. Death, being childless, wants our children from us. Oh, Gerald, when you were naked, I clothed you. When you were hungry, I gave you food. Night and day, all that long winter, I tended you. No offices too mean, no care too lowly for the thing we women love. And oh, how I loved you. N not Hannah, Samuel Moore. And you needed love. For you were weakly, and only love could have kept you alive. Only love can keep anyone alive. Boys are careless often, and without thinking give pain. 
and you made many friends and went into their houses and were glad with them and and I, knowing my secret, did not dare to follow, but stayed at home and closed the door and shut out the sun and sat in darkness. What should I have done in honest households? My past was ever with me. And you thought I didn't care for the pleasant things of life. I tell you I longed for them, but did not dare to touch them feeling I had no right. You thought I was happier working amongst the poor. That was my mission you imagined. It was not, but where else was I to go? The sick do not ask if the hand that smooths their pillow is pure, nor the dying care if the lips that touch their brow have known the kiss of sin. It was you I thought of all the time. I gave to them the love you did not need, lavished on them a love that was not theirs. And you thought I spent too much time in going to church and in church duties. But where else could I turn? God's house is the only house where sinners are made welcome. And you were always in my heart, Gerald. Too much in my heart. For though day after day, at morn or even song, I have knelt in God's house. I have never repented of my sin. How could I repent of my sin when you, my love, were its fruit? Even now that you are bitter to me, I cannot repent. I do not. You are more to me than innocence. I would rather be your mother, oh, much rather, than have always been pure. Mother, I didn't know you loved me so much as that. And I will be a better son to you than I have been. And you and I must never leave each other. But, Mother, I can't help it. You must become my father's wife. You must marry him. It is your duty. Hester runs in from the terrace and embraces Mrs. Arbuthnot. No, no, you shall not. That would be real dishonor, the first you have ever known. That would be real disgrace, the first to touch you. Leave him and come with me. There are other countries than England. Oh, other countries over the sea, better, wiser, and less unjust lands. The world is very wide and very big. Oh no, not for me. For me, the world is shivelled to a palm's breadth. And where I walk, there are thorns. It shall not be so. We shall somewhere find green valleys and fresh waters. And if we weep, we will weep together. Have we not both loved him? Esther! Don't. Don't. You cannot love me at all unless you love her also. You cannot honor me unless she's holier to you. In her her all womanhood is martyred. Not she alone, but all of us are stricken in her house. Hester, Hester, what shall I do? Do you respect the man who is your father? Respect him? I despise him. He is infamous. I thank you for saving me from him last night. Ah, that is nothing. I would die to save you. But you don't get to tell me what to do now. Have I not thanked you for saving me? But what should I do? Ask your own heart, not mine. I never had a mother to save. Or shame. He is hard. He is hard. Let me go away. Mother, forgive me. I have been to blame. Oh, 
don't kiss my hands, they are cold. My heart is cold, something has broken it. Oh, don't say that. Hearts live by being wounded. Pleasure may turn a heart to stone. Riches may make it callous, but sorrow, oh, sorrow cannot break it. Besides, what sorrows have you now? Why, at this moment, you are more dear to him than ever. Dear, though you have been, and oh, how dear you have been, always. Be kind to him. You are my mother and my father, all in one. I need no second parent. It was for you I spoke, for you alone. Oh, say something, mother. Have I but found one love to lose another? Don't tell me that. Oh, mother, you are cruel. But has he found, indeed, another love? You know I have loved him always. We are poor. Who, being loved, is poor? No one. I hate my riches. They are a burden. Let him share it with me. But we are disgraced. We rank among the outcasts. Gerald is nameless. The sins of the, of the parents should be visited on the children. It is God's law. I was wrong. God's law is only love. Gerald, I cannot give you a father, but I have brought you a wife. Mother, I am not worthy either of her or you. So she comes first, you are worthy. And when you are away, Gerald, with her, oh, think of me sometimes. Don't forget me. And when you pray, pray for me. We should pray when we are happiest. And you will be happy, Gerald. You don't think of leaving us? Mother, you won't leave us. Uh, I might bring shame on you. Mother! For a little then. And if you let me near you always. Come out with us to the garden. <laughs> later on. Later on. Exit Hester and Gerald. Alice re-enters the room. A gentleman to see you, ma'am. Oh, say I am not at home. Oh, show me the card. Say I will not see him. A time later, Lord Illingworth enters. What can he have to say to me today? What can you have to say to me today, George Harford? You can have nothing to say to me. You must leave this house. Rachel, Gerald knows everything about you and me now, so some arrangement must be come to that will suit us all three. I assure you, you will find in me the most charming and generous of fathers. My son may come in at any moment. I saved you last night. I may not be able to save you again. My son feels my dishonor strongly, terribly strongly. I beg you to go. Last night was excessively unfortunate. That silly Puritan girl making a scene merely because I wanted to kiss her. What harm is there in a kiss? A kiss may ruin a human life, George Harford. I know that. I know that too well. We won't discuss that at present. What is of importance today, as yesterday, is still our son. 
I am extremely fond of him, as you know, and although it may seem, I admired his conduct last night immensely. He took up the cudgels for that pretty prude with wonderful promptitude. He is just what I should have liked a son of mine to be. Except that no son of mine should ever take up the side of the Puritans. That is always an error. Now, what I propose is this. Lord Illingworth, no proposition of yours interests me. According to our ridiculous English laws, I can't legitimize Gerald. But I can leave him my property. Illingworth is in town, of course, but it is a tedious barrack of a place. He can have Ashby, which is much prettier, Harborough, which has the best shooting in the north of England, and the house in St. James Square. What more can a gentleman require in this world? Nothing more, I am quite sure. As for title, uh, title is really rather a nuisance in these democratic days. As George Harford, I had everything I wanted. Now I have merely everything that other people want, which isn't nearly so pleasant. But my proposal is this. I told you I was not interested and I beg you to go. The boy is to be with you for six months in the year and with me for the other six. That is perfectly fair, is it not? You can have whatever allowance you like and live wherever you choose. As for your past, no one knows anything about it except myself and Gerald. There is the Puritan, of course, the Puritan in white muslin. But she doesn't count. She couldn't tell the story without explaining that she objected to being kissed, could she? And all women would think her a fool and the men think her a bore. And you need not be afraid that Gerald won't be my heir. I needn't tell you I have not the slightest intention of marrying. You come too late. My son has no need of you. You are not necessary. What do you mean, Rachel? That you are not necessary to Gerald's career. He does not require you. I do not understand you. Look in the garden. You had better not let them see you. You bring unpleasant memories. She loves him. They love each other. We are safe from you and we are going away. Where? We will not tell you. And if you find us, we will not know you. You seem surprised. What welcome would you get from the girl whose lips you tried to soil? From the boy whose life you have shamed? From the mother whose dishonor comes from you? You have grown hard, Rachel. I was too weak once. It is well for me that I have changed. I was very young at the time. We men know life too early. And we women know life too late. That is the difference between men and women. Rachel, I want my son. My money may be of no use to him now. I may be of no use to him. But I want my son. Bring us together, Rachel. You can do it if you choose. There is no room in my boy's life for you. He is not interested in you. Then why does my, why does my son Write to me. What do you mean? What, what letter is this? That is nothing. Oh, give it to me. It is addressed to me. Oh, you are not to open it. I forbid you to open it. And in Gerald's handwriting. 
it was not to have been sent. It is a letter he wrote to you this morning before he saw me, but he is sorry now he wrote it, very sorry. You are not to open it, give it to me. It belongs to me. He reads over it slowly, Mrs. Arbuth not watching him all the time. You have read this letter, I suppose, Rachel? No. You know what is in it? Yes. I don't admit for a moment that the boy is right in what he says. I don't admit that it is my duty of mine to marry you. I deny it entirely. But to get my son back, I am ready. Yes. I am ready to marry you, Rachel, and to treat you always with the deference and respect due to my wife. I will marry you as soon as you choose. I give you my word of honor. You made that promise to me once before and broke it. I will keep it now. And that will show you that I love my son at least as much as you love him. For when I marry you, Rachel, there are some ambitions I shall have to surrender. High ambitions too. Any ambition is high. I decline to marry you, Lord Illingworth. Are you serious? Yes. Do tell me your reasons. They would interest me enormously. I have already explained them to my son. I suppose they were intensely sentimental, weren't they? Women live by their emotions and for them. You have no philosophy of life. We women live by our emotions and for them, by our passions and for them, if you will. I have two passions, Lord Illingworth, my love of him and my hate of you. You cannot kill those. They feed each other. What sort of love is that which needs to have hate as its brother? It is the sort of love I have for Gerald. Do you think that terrible? Well, it is terrible. All love is terrible. All love is a tragedy. I loved you once, Lord Illingworth. Oh, what a tragedy for a woman to have loved you. So you really refuse to marry me? Yes. Because you hate me? Yes. And does my son hate me as you do? No. I'm glad of that, Rachel. He merely despises you. What a pity. Pity for him, I mean. Oh, don't be deceived, George. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. May I ask by what arguments you made the boy who wrote this letter, this beautiful, passionate letter, believe that you should not marry his father, the father of your own child? It is not I who made him see it. It was another. What fan echoed person? The Puritan, Lord Illingworth.
there is nothing, there is not much. There is nothing then left for me to do, Rachel. Nothing. It is goodbye, is it? Forever, I hope, this time, Lord Illingworth. How curious. At this moment, you look exactly as you looked the night you left me 20 years ago. You have just the same expression in your mouth. On my word, Rachel, no woman ever loved me as you did. Why, you gave me yourself like a flower to do anything I liked with. You were the prettiest of playthings, the most fascinating of small romances. He pulls out his watch and a glove falls from his pocket to the floor. Quarter to two. Must be strolling back to Hunstanton. Don't suppose I shall see you there again. I'm sorry. I am. Really. It's been an amusing experience to have met amongst people of one's own rank. And treated quite seriously, too. One's mistress. And one's bath. She strikes Lord Illingworth across the face. After a moment, he controls himself and crosses to the window to look at his son. He sighs and leaves the room. He would have said it. He would have said it. Enter Hester and Gerald from the garden. Well, dear mother, you never came out after all. So we have come to fetch you and... Mother, have you not been crying? Oh, my boy. My boy. My boy. But you have two children now. You will let me be your daughter. Would you choose me for a mother? You of all the women I have ever known. On turning round, Gerald sees Lord Illingworth's glove lying on the floor and picks it up. Hello, Mother. Whose glove is this? You've had a visitor. Who was it? Oh, no one. No one in particular. A man of no importance. 